Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar on a reach restriction on PER and polyfluoroalkyl substances, the group commonly referred to as PFAS. My name is Peter Simpson and I'm the Restriction Process Coordinator here at ECA. ECA is hosting today's webinar on behalf of the five authorities undertaking the investigation and assessment on this potential restriction, Germany, the Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden and Norway. All the presentations today are pre-recorded, but the question and answer session is in real time. My short introduction will introduce the objectives and practicalities of the event, and I will then hand over to Martin Beekman from the Netherlands, who will introduce the speakers and guide you through the rest of the event. So, what can you expect from today? You should be able to learn a little bit about the REACH restriction process, if you're not already familiar with that. And then you will learn about the work being done by the five authorities on the REACH restriction, including how they've set up their work and the progress that they have made so far. You'll also have the opportunity to get answers to questions. Before I hand over to Martin Beekman, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how you can ask the panel a question. Today we'll be using Slido for the questions and answers. Slido event is already open and you can navigate to this now using the website slido.com. You can ask questions to the speakers and any of our other panelists until quarter past three Central European time and we will aim at answering as many questions as possible during the event. Please do keep your questions within the scope of today's webinar. Um, questions outside of the scope I'm afraid will not be answered. If you have any questions after the event, you can, of course, contact us and you can use the contact form that you can see uh, on the link on the screen in front of you. I'd like to remind you that the material will be published on the website after this event so that all of the presentations and uh, the Q&A uh, will be available uh, on the webinar page and you can navigate to the page using the link here on the screen. I'll now hand over to Martin Beekman, who will introduce you to the presenters and their presentations. Thank you, Martin. Over to you. Hello, my name is Martin Beekman. I will be your chair today. For the Netherlands, I'm responsible for the PFAS restriction project, which is the topic of today's webinar. I'm educated in environmental chemistry at the University of Utrecht. After that, I did some research and then since 2001, I became involved in the national and international chemical policy for the Netherlands. First at the ministry and later on at the National Institute for Public Health and the Environment. I would like to start with thanking ECA for hosting this webinar and Peter for introducing the practicalities. At the beginning of this year, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Germany and the Netherlands joined forces and agreed to prepare a broad restriction dossier for PFAS. In our countries, there is a growing concern in relation to PFAS. For example, in the Netherlands, we have many debates about the water and air emissions from Kemur and Dordrecht. And also there was a lot of discussion on soil which was contaminated with PFAS. And similar debates are going on in the other countries as well. Although there is a lot of attention to PFAS nowadays, the, the problem is already on the international policy agenda for quite some time. In the beginning of this century, the use of PFAS in firefighting foams was European restricted uh, by, by the previous legislation. Uh, but what we see happened is that PFOS in many occasions was replaced by other PFOS substances and not only in firefighting foams but in other applications as well. Therefore, we decided to prepare a broad restriction regime to avoid the substitution from one PFOS to the other. The aim of this broad restriction is to restrict all PFOS in non-essential uses. Well, there are, that's, are two big things which I mentioned. All PFAS, what does all PFAS mean? 
and essential use. Well, in this webinar, we will explain what we think uh, should be included in the restriction. That's in the presentation of Dr. Mandy Lokai. The other question, essential use, we will not touch upon in this webinar. Uh, uh, we are working on it. It's part of the process of um, making this restriction or shade. And we also will cooperate on this respect with the European Commission. As you know, uh, very recently, the European chemical strategy has been published, including a staff working document on PFAS. And also there, uh, there is uh, this uh, definition of criteria for essential use mentioned. So there is a need for a good cooperation between the five countries, the European Commission and ECHA. Well, and I think this webinar is a good example of the good cooperation between us and ECHA. On the screen, you can see the program of today's webinar. We will start with two presentations. The first one is by Jenny Iverson, on the, and it explains why this PFAS restriction is needed. The second one is from Dr. Mandy Lokai, and she will explain the REACH restriction process and the status of the current PFAS restriction. I will now shortly uh, introduce both presenters. Jenny Iffesen is a strategic advisor and project manager at the Swedish Chemi Chemicals Agency, where she has worked for over nine years. She is a chemical engineer by training. She is the restriction process coordinator of the Swedish Chemicals Agency, as well as the coordinator for the agency's overall work on PFAS. Jenny is also leading, leading Sweden's work on this broad PFAS restriction proposal. Mindy Lokai is an expert in the unit Chemicals Evaluation and Risk Management at the Federal Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. She has a PhD in biochemistry from the University of London. She used to work as a research scientist at the Max Planck Institute before moving to the Federal Institute in 2016. She is advising and coordinating the restriction process on the REACH, including the PFAS restriction work from the side of the German authorities. So after these two presentations, we will have uh, a live question and answer session. But now first it is time for the presentation of Jenny Iverson. Hello, uh, my name is Jenny Iverson and I um, coordinate the Swedish Chemicals Agency's work on PFAS and I am going to give you an introduction on the need for this PFAS restriction. I assume most of you are familiar with PFAS, so I will only give you a short background. This is a group of man-made chemicals that has been produced since the 1950s. It is a complex group that can be divided into a number of subgroups. The OECD has published a global database of PFAS listing 4,730 PFAS, including several new groups of PFAS that fulfill the common definition, meaning that they contain at least one perfluoroalkyl moiety. PFAS have many attractive technical properties. They are repellent to water, grease and dirt. They are temperature resistant and film foam forming. Uh, however, other less desirable properties are their extreme persistence in the environment in combination with other negative environmental and health effects. Due to their Technical properties, PFAS are used in many different articles and chemical products. Um, examples of well-known uses are textiles, firefighting foams, and food contact materials. But the list of uses is long. There is a widespread use of these chemicals in products for both professionals and consumers. Uh, now I will give you examples of the worrying observations we have seen. Uh, in humans, blood serum and blood plasma are matrixing for biomonitoring of PFAS. Uh, generally, according to a recent EFSA study, after the year 2000, uh, the concentrations of PFOS, PFOA and PFOA 
age excess have decreased, uh, while the concentrations of the longer C9 to C11 uh, PFCAs have increased. And no clear trends have been reported for uh, other PFAS. The most noticeable PFAS in serum uh, of adults and children were PF PFOS and PFOA. Much higher concentration, concentrations have been observed for some individuals, and this include workers and populations which have been exposed to contaminated drinking waters. And PFAS in biota, uh, we see that one thing that all PFAS have in common is the ability to disperse over long distances through air and water. And this leads to that they can be detected uh, far from where they are produced or used, for example, uh, in Arctic environments. This makes PFAS very much a global problem. And different PFAS disperse uh, in the environment in different ways. Fluorotelomers and other uh, volatile PFAS can be dispersed uh, over large areas in, in the air, and less volatile ionized forms are mainly dispersed in water where they bound to organic particles or through absor uh, absor absorption uh, into living organisms. And PFAS can be found in water environment almost everywhere, from the Arctic to the Antarctic uh, uh, and across Europe. Uh, old generation PFAS, as well as new ones, have been detected in drinking waters. But since the monitoring so far is limited in the EU, we have reason to suspect there might be hidden the statistics of PFAS in drinking water. One example is uh, Veneto uh, in uh, Italy, where industrial activity has led to contamination of drinking water with PFAS for over 100,000 uh, citizens. Once PFAS are released to the environment, they are very difficult to remove. And the reason is that many of them are very soluble in water and have a long sorption potential, which results in a, a preferred distribution to the water phase. Uh, conventional cleaning techniques do not work here. And now we come into the health effects and studies that have been conducted regard, uh, regarding the health hazards of PFAS are largely experimental animal trials. In studies of uh, mammals, it's common to find the effects on the liver, uh, blood, blood lipids, um, thyroid uh, hormones, the immune system and the re reproductive system. Other effects observed for individual PFAS include tumors. Uh, further, further studies are, uh, however, required to establish whether these results are also relevant to humans. Some uh, studies have also been conducted on groups of people who have been exposed to high levels of PFAS because of local water contamination. And these studies have demonstrated uh, a correlation between increased levels of PFAS and PFOA in the blood and impaired immune, immune function. And researchers have also observed correlation between elevated levels of PFOA in the blood and effects on the liver and cholesterol levels. Effects of birth weight have also been observed. There is evidence that a few PFAS present present a health hazard, for example, PFOS and PFOA, which are classified as reproductive toxins and suspected carcinogenic. This is limited, uh, there is limited knowledge of uh, the health effects of many PFAS, but based on similarities between them, there is a good reason to consider all PFAS as health hazard. Uh, and another factor is that based on their similarities, combinations effects of PFAS can be expected. <laughs> 
So how can we then explain these observations? What are the reasons? All PFAS are extremely persistent, uh, either themselves or their, they degrade to other extremely persistent PFAS. PFAS precursors break down to stable arrowhead substances, such as different PFCAs. Uh, the reasons for the extreme stability is the strong carbon fluorine uh, bond, and they do, don't degrade under normal environmental conditions and may survive in the environment for decades and centuries. Some PFAS bioaccumulate in living, or living organisms, but may then be uh, biomagnified when they increase through the food chain. A correlation has been observed in fish between the amount of PFAS the fish accumulate and the length of the carbon chain in the PFAS molecule. Uh, this means that long-chain PFAS accumulates strongly in contrast to short-chain PFAS. And unlike many other bioaccumulative substances, fat and water repellent uh, PFAS are not stored in fatty tissue. Instead, they bind to protein and are stored in other bodily organs, for example, the liver and blood. Uh, we have also seen that PFAS can be absorbed by plants, but here the inverse applies uh, with short-chain PFAS accumulating to a greater extent than long-chain. Many PFAS are very mobile in the environment, especially the shorter PFAS with polar functional groups that have high water solubility and low ad adsorption potential. And the non-stop input and presence in the water results in a constant bioavailability. Volatile uh, PFAS such as fluorotelomeres are mobile via air transportation. High mobility helps then a long, uh, long range transport to remote areas. And together with extreme persis uh, persistence and concentrations for bioaccumulation and mobility becomes um, to some degree uh, interchangeable. We have knowledge on toxicity and ecotoxicity for a few PFAS, even if in information is increasing. Um, toxicological uh, effects uh, that can be connected to PFAS will continue for decades and centuries since there is a non-stop release to the environment. There are knowledge gaps since it is difficult to assess um, adverse effects for long-term across generational exposure. And based on these properties, we see a reason for concern. So to summarize, uh, the main concern for the group of PFAS is their persistence in combination with supporting concerns such as, such as bioaccumulation, mobility and toxicity, and related consequences of their use during its life cycle. For example, potential contamination of ground, soil and drinking water and being not retrievable. And here we have listed several of the elements of concern that I mentioned in my presentation. And this is why we see a need for risk management and specifically a restriction. Well, uh, thank you very much for listening. And now we will move on to the next point in the program. Hi, my name is Mandy Lokai. I'm an expert um, at the Federal Office for Chemicals, which is a German competent authority responsible for REACH. I am advising and coordinating the restriction process under REACH, including the PFAS restriction work. The aim of this presentation is to outline and explain the REACH restriction process, and secondly, to give an update on the current status of work towards a PFAS restriction proposal. As a note, I would like to mention that all abbreviations used in the presentation are listed on a slide at the end.
So um, in May, upon launching a call for evidence with regard to PFAS, it was made public news via the ECHA and um, several national homepages that five EU member states, namely Germany, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden and Denmark, agreed to prepare a joint restriction proposal. So what um, does it mean to prepare a restriction um, under REACH? So the aim of the REACH regulation is an EU-wide protection of human health and the environment. If there are risks posed by chemicals which are not adequately controlled, those can be addressed via different risk management measures, such as a restriction. Um, restriction is often considered the best or risk management option of choice, as there are several advantages. These advantages include that restriction can address firstly substances and groups of substances, including precursors, secondly uses of substances and concentrations below 0.1%, and thirdly imported articles. Further, there are very few limitations to the scope of a restriction and restrictions can be targeted and um, specifically useful in addressing non-standard hazard and risk. Restriction can be a safety net and used as a tool where risk cannot be addressed by other REACH processes or other EU legislations. So restrictions usually limit or ban the manufacture, placing on the market and or use of a substance. Restriction can also set out specific conditions, um, for example, technical measurements or labeling requirements. Um, an Annex 15 dossier submitter of a restriction proposal can be ECHA if requested by Commission beforehand or a member state. The intention to prepare a restriction proposal has to be notified into the Registry of Intentions, which is in short the RI. Um, following the notification, the Annex 15 restriction dossier has to be submitted within the legally binding time of 12 months. So the reg registry of intentions indicates when a restriction proposal is planned to be submitted to ECHA for a particular substance or substance group. The link to the registry of restriction intentions is given at the bottom of the slide. So um, as I previously said, the notification into the registry of intentions triggers the reach restriction process according to Article 68, which is shown schematically on this slide with the corresponding timelines to the right of the slide. Um, as just explained, um, following the entry into the registry of intention, the dossier submitter has 12 months time to prepare the Annex 15 restriction dossier for submission to ECHA. Following the submission to ECHA and the passing um, a conformity check, the opinion development phase of 12 months starts. During this opinion development phase, um, the two ECHA committees, RAC and SEAC, are discussing the um, Annex 15 restriction proposal. And at the same time, a public consultation of six months is launched in which any um, interested party can submit comments with regard to this Annex 15 restriction proposal. Um, later on during this opinion development phase, also the draft of the SEAC um, opinion will be publicly, publicly available for a two months commenting period. The opinion development phase will be finished following um, the, the publication of the RAC and SEAC opinion. Um, all these documents, which means the final RAC-SEAC opinion, the Annex 15 restriction dossier, all the comments of the public consultations will be handed over to the European Commission, which will um, take these into account and uh, should draft a proposal for, of a legal text amending Annex 17 of REACH within three months. And this draft is then um, discussed with all member states and the Re REACH committee and then finally adopted. And then that means that then the restriction enters into force. There are several PFAS that are already either regulated or currently in the restri REACH restriction process. And these are listed on this slide. PFAS and 
also P4, are included and regulated under the POP regulation, which is an EU-wide regulation on persistent organic pollutants. Therefore, the restriction entry number 68 with regard to P4 and Annex 17 of REACH um, will be amended accordingly. Also, the placing on the market of um, fluorinated T6 siloxanes in spray products containing other organic solvents is banned via restriction entry 73 and Annex 17. There are several ongoing um, restriction um, processes concerning PFAS. One, the first would be the restriction proposal with regard to perfluor um, carboxylic acids with 9 to 14 carbon acids. Um, this is at the level of the REACH committee. For the restriction proposal concerning PFHXS, the publication of the final rac seac opinion is expected um, to happen soon. The restriction proposal for PFHXA, um, for this the public consultation just ended in September. However, the opinion development phase in RAC and SEAC is still ongoing. Just recently, at the start of October, ECA declared its, its intention to um, prepare a restriction proposal for PFAS and firefighting, fo firefighting foams. And um, last, the PFAS broad restriction, which is the theme of this webinar, is currently still in a preparatory phase. I would like to use this slide to visualize um, the ongoing PFAS restriction related processes. As I just mentioned here at this stage, are the C9 to C14 PFCAs, PFHXS restriction proposal. We expect the final AXEAC opinion to be there soon. In the middle of the opinion development phase, we have the PFHXA restriction proposal. As I just said, for the PFAS and firefighting foams, um, ECA just declared its, its intention to prepare a um, restriction proposal. And um, my main point and most important point would be that I'd like to emphasize that the current PFAS restriction work is prior to um, an entry into the registry of intentions, so in a preparatory MOA-like phase. Um, preparatory work for restriction is not unusual, so if a member state or ECA, um, if requested by the Commission, have a concern that a substance or group of substances poses a risk to human health or the environment, preparatory work takes place investigating the problem through risk regulatory management option analysis and RMOA. And the competent authority for reach of the five member states previously mentioned um, are currently working on what we would like to call an analysis of restriction options for PFAS in the frame of an RMOA. And this preparatory work and our RMOA intention has been notified into the pact. And on the slide, you can find also the link for the pact in this notification. In the preparatory phase, a call for evidence was launched, which started in May and um, ended in July. For this call for evidence, an uh, online questionnaire was designed in order to get a better understanding of the identity, hazards and uses of PFAS that would be in scope of the PFAS restriction proposal, as well as their alternatives. Um, circa 560 responses were received. And the responses and information received in the call for evidence uh, will not be published, as this is a preparatory RMOA-like phase, which is not a formal procedure under REACH. The planning and coordination of the follow-up of the call for evidence is still ongoing. This webinar is a first step, and the different competent authorities will contact the participants of the call for evidence in the follow-up phase, And but this phase can uh, last from the second half of this year till also the um, first half of next year. Due to the high number of particip participations for the exchange will be pursued if necessary and needed. Um, contacts and or invitations to meetings might also be sent out by consultants as some member states contracted consultants assisting them in their assessment. So the aim of this preparatory phase of a PFAS restriction proposal is to address all PFAS as a group of substances. This is also why um, in the call for evidence, a very broad scope was used as a starting point. 
So um, for this, PFAS were defined as all substances that contain at least one aliphatic CF2 or CF3 element. And this chemical definition already makes it very clear that this would cover many substances, um, at least all the 4,700 PFAS on the OECD list and about 6,800 registered and CNL notified PFAS. And further, it would also cover substances of various structures. And here um, is a non-exhaustive list of a few examples. This would include per and polyfluoralkyl acid, sulfonic acid ether-based structures, side chain and backbone fluorinated polymers, hydrofluorocarbons, as well as side chain fluorinated aromatics. So despite the differences in structure and structural properties, we see an underlying concern for all members of the PFAS group, which is their very high um, persistence. So almost all um, PFAS are either very persistent or degrade to persistent PFAS. Precursors are transformed to arrowhead substances and PFAS arrowheads are among the most stable organic compounds known due to the strong carbon fluorine bond, which means that these PFAS survive in the environment for decades to centuries and also expose future generations. Um, in addition to the persistence as a main common concern for the whole PFAS group, um, bioaccumulation and mobility been as a supporting concern for a lot of substances of the PFAS group. So certain PFAS bi bioaccumulate in living organisms. And unlike many other bioaccumulative substances, PFAS bind to proteins and are stored in other bodily organs, for example, liver and blood. All PFAS have, due to their extreme persistence, a lot of time to distribute, no matter how bioaccumulative they are. In addition, small molecule PFAS, with, for example, polar groups, are often mobile in the aqueous environment due to their high aqueous solubility and low absorption potential. So a continuous presence in water results in continuous bioavailability. So high mobility facilitates long range transport to even remote areas. So in combination with um, very high persistence, the concerns for bioaccumulation and mobility to some extent become inter interchangeable and may be regarded ex as exposure facilitators. In addition, ecotoxicity is seen um, as a supporting concern as the information on ecotoxicological effects for uh, PFAS or for substances belonging to the PFAS group are growing. So considering the release of the very persistent chemicals and their continuous and increasing concentrations in the environment, when adverse effects are identified, it will be technically challenging and costly or even impossible to reverse the chemical contamination and therefore the effects. Therefore, threats of irreversible damage are faced. So the EU-wide concern, which means the unacceptable risk following Article 69, is in our opinion given by the very high persistence of PFAS, which means a very long-lasting presence, plus the consequences of much, a much higher likelihood for particularly serious adverse effects. The latter is being supported by increasing knowledge about the ecotoxicological effects of PFAS and the bioaccumulative and mobile properties of a lot of PFAS facilitating exposure. Therefore, to address this unacceptable risk, restriction is seen as this earlier mentioned risk management measure of choice to address these identified non-standard hazards and risks. So the preparatory phase was also um, started with a very broad scope related to uses of PFAS. So um, currently in scope are all uses of these substances. And here again is a non-exhaustive list of um, PFAS uses. These range from textiles um, over cosmetics, consumer mixtures, the electronics sector and energy sector to transport F gases. Um, up to food contact materials and to force. 
The five member states involved in the PFAS restriction work have coordinated and divided the work and the follow-up um, of the call for evidence mainly according to use areas of PFAS. Therefore, the assessment um, is taking place according to use with different member states in lead for different uses. Also, one member state might be in lead. Um, information and conclusions will be shared and discussed with all member states involved. This slide is meant to give you an overview of the responsibility for different use areas and the contact person. The assessment of uses and applications not listed on the previous slide are planned to start, be started at a later stage. And it's not only the assessments that are ongoing, um, we will also prepare study reports for the use areas, including information on emission and alternatives. And this kind of information will also be later on part of the Annex 15 dossier. Um, the use of PFAS and firefighting pumps will be excluded from the scope of the broad PFAS restriction work as um, ECHR, as I already mentioned, declared its intention to prepare a separate restriction proposal for this use. Um, the outcome and information of the preparatory phase will form part of an RMOA conclusion document, which we would like to prepare in order to describe different risk management options and to transparently demonstrate how the initial scope of the PFAS restriction upon entry into the Registry of Intentions was considered. Um, we are also planning the publication of uh, this conclusion document in the pact for the first half of 2021. Please note that the RMOA conclusion document will not be discussed separately but it will form part of the Annex 15 dossier. The entry into the Registry of Intention is planned following the publication of the conclusion document for the first half of 2021. So to also visualize this kind of timing, um, I show it again in this restriction scheme that you have seen before as detailed as this is currently possible. Of course, you already noticed all depends on the entry into the registry of intention but if this is done in the first half of 2021 and um, the annex 15 dossier um, concerning the PFAS restriction proposal will be submitted to ECHA around the first half of 2022 and then the timing becomes very rough but let's say in 2025 we would expect a restriction to enter into force. This is a slide of listing the abbrevi abbreviations that were used in the presentations that are already mentioned. And um, with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. So this is our expert panel of today. Two experts and myself I have already introduced at the start of this webinar. I will now introduce the three other expert in this expert panel. First we have Oden Hegeland. Oden Hegeland is senior advisor in the chemical section of the Norwegian Environmental Agency. Oden has a PhD in organic chemistry and he used to work as a research scientist in the pharmaceutical industry before moving to the Environment Agency in 2012. Oden is working on chemicals regulation under REITs with experience from several PFAS cases. Oden is national contact point for Norway in the PFAS restriction. Well, Sweden, Jenny Iverson, you I already introduced. Then we have from Denmark, Toke Winter. Toke Winter is educated in chemistry and physics at the University of Southern Denmark. And before moving to the Danish Environmental Protection Agency in 2014, Toke has been working at Nordic Eco Label and as a consultant. At the Danish EPA, Toke is working with chemical regulation on the CLP and REACH. Toke is also coordinating of all issues related to PFAS at the Danish EPA. And last, last but not least, Peter Simpson. Besides our host of today, Peter is a senior scientific officer at the European Chemicals Agency. With over 20 years experience on the risk assessment and risk management of chemicals. Peter is an ecotoxicologist and he is currently coordinating the restriction process at ECHA.
Peter is also leading ECA's work on several restriction dossiers like microplastics, lead and PVC, DECA BDE. And prior to joining ECA, Peter worked as a chemical risk assessment consultant and for the Environmental Agency of England and Wales. During uh, the preparation of this webinar, we already received several questions of you. Part of these questions were relating to the process and timing and scope of our work. In the presentation of Mandy Lokai, she already explained many of these issues. So I hope your questions are answered. In the presentation of Jenny Everson, she explained the underpinning of the dossier. So I also assume that Jenny Everson did answer many of the questions related to that topic. If that's not the case, of course, you are invited to add follow-up questions during the Q&A session or to ask further explanation on this. Also, we received several questions in relation to the essential use and the definition of criteria for essential use. I explained at the beginning of the webinar that we will not discuss this concept today because it's part of the work currently undertaken. Before starting the live chat, I would like to highlight some questions we received uh, in, in my introduction. So we received quite some presentations in relation to the Green Deal, to innovation aspects, saying we should need PFAS in these kind of innovations. In general, our answer on that question is, we are of course aware of the unique and useful properties of PFAS from a technical point of view, but there is a common concern, as we explained, the persistency in the environment. And in our view, it's important to consider all these PFAS in one proposal to reassure a coherent approach and avoid regrettable substitution. A next question is how does our proposal, a broad PFAS restriction, relate to the other PFAS restrictions? Because several PFAS are already subject to restrictions or are on their way to being restricted. And this one is also mentioned in the presentation by Dr. Lokai. And we are, of course, aware of all these ongoing discussions. We started this project for this very broad restriction because we think it's good to consider the group of PFAS as a whole and to come up with one proposal to reassure a coherent approach. And of course, in the end of the process, we have to consider what that, how does it influence the other restrictions. But in this work, we are now undertaking that's the, the real aim of our work, to get to this complete broad overview. And finally, I prioritized one other question. That's also that there is quite some other legislation outside reach, also touching upon several uses of PFAS. And can we avoid double regulation there? The answer is more or less the same as in the previous one, because as explained, we would like to see and to investigate the very broad use of PFAS with all different kinds of PFAS. And of course, there are overlaps with current legislation. And it is in our interest to avoid this double regulation. But as explained again, we think it's important as part of the preparatory work to assess these kinds of overlap. And of course, if needed, we can see if there's a need for exemption or derogation. Thank you very much, and we can now start the Q&A session. Hello again. Many thanks to Martin and all of the presenters, panelists, as well as all of you who have submitted questions. I hope that you found this session useful and that you had your questions answered. Any questions that have been not been answered today will be included in the Q&A document that will be published subsequently. Again, if you have questions after the event, please use the contact forms. And then just a reminder that today's material will shortly be available on the ECHO website 
on the webinars pages and you can see the link to that here. Thank you all again and goodbye.